kind of a generic lecture based for all the health sciences people on campus because last time I did it, there were less dental students, more med students, social workers, all sorts of stuff, pharmacy students. So anybody stressed, raise your hands. <laughs> Burnt out. <laughs> So the lecture is applicable for everyone, myself included. I've probably been more burnout than all of you because I've gone the next step after dental school and probably not for this lot of practice and kids so on and so forth. So we'll talk about combating stress, managing burnout. If you're interested, this is the top of the Columbia Press Crater on Mount Rainier on a glorious morning after we hit the summit. It's probably taking it about 7 a.m. You'll find a lot of references to mountaineering for me because climbing mountains in a lot like life, and it's one of the things I do to de-stress. But for the purposes of the lecture, we go through some definitions. So stress arises when individuals perceive they cannot adequately cope with the demands being made on them or with threats to their well-being. Okay, and for all of you, there's a different point where that happens, myself included. This term of allostasis versus homeostasis and allostatic load is also an interesting concept that we study a lot. So this allostasis is how your body maintains stability through change. So you've got a lot of changes going on with your professional lives right now in education, you've got changes in family, a lot of different pressures placed on you, and how your body physiologically adapts to that through your autonomic nervous system, hypothalamic pituitary axis, cardiovascular system is different for each and every one of you in here. So everybody's got a different allostatic load, how much of that they're bearing. And that allostatic load becomes important, okay? Now, you know, along with that, is your prior experiences in life and where you're at. So the dental students are going to have a different environmental stressor than the medical student or anyone else who's in any other professional location and so on and so forth. And you add to that any trauma, abuse that people have had and major life events. And all of this stuff together is what's creating this allostatic load. You also have to couple that with your genetics and your ability to tolerate that stress but you certainly are underneath it, okay? And if you're walking around like the sumo wrestler, you know, on the top graph, I've got it, I've got it all in balance, I'm balancing my surgical load, my clinical load, this is my family life, that's great, that may seem like your system's in balance, right? The teeter-totter's in the middle, but that's gonna have some profound health issues as you go down the road, okay? Which system would you rather be in, the top or the bottom? I'd rather be in the bottom one, right? So that has got an allostatic load that's much less than the top. And I wish I could tell you that yours changes from the top to the bottom once you graduate dental school, but unfortunately, it's probably going to get worse because you're going to have to do your loan repayments. You're going to acquire a practice. You're going to have a family. It's going to ramp up. So it's not just all rainbows and possibilities the day you get your DDS, okay? It, uh, it, it's difficult, okay? So we figured out that. So all of that allostatic load when it gets out of control is leading to stress, which is linked to about every disease in the body systematically. Okay? And depending on your genetics, it might be a real problem. So estimates that are interesting for me as a you know, physician as well is, which is 60 to 80% of outpatient visits may be related to stress. That's going to see primary care physician. That's a pretty dramatic amount. Link to all physical causes of death. We talked about associated development of most major mental health problems, depression, PTSD, pathologic aging. That's a big problem. How much of your curriculum has been devoted to stress? This is probably it, right? This might be the only hour you get. So woefully underdone in all of the health science professions, okay? So we don't get much education on it. Work-related stressors that we all have. Being unhappy in your job, heavy workload, working long hours, unclear expectations, dangerous conditions, insecurity about advancement. Is this familiar to anybody? Anybody have this every day? Most of you are undergoing some degree of it, right? 
schools cup, professional schools are tough. Giving speeches in front of colleagues, hopefully not facing, you know, facing discrimination. Okay? So everybody's under stress. So unfortunately, it's easy for me to say you should not be stressed, okay? But like we made an allusion to, most people rarely or never practice stress reduction <coughs> techniques themselves. Who in the room is doing any stress reduction? Yoga, meditation, anything like that, physical exercise at least? Most people are about doing some exercise, so that's good. Okay, so those who do practice use the following. Exercise, 70%, that's kind of what most of you have shown me in here. Meditation, imagery, deep breathing, all those can kind of be looped in together with this mindfulness, which we'll go into, and the PMR is progressive muscle relaxation. So those are techniques that caregivers that do practice stress relieving techniques get in. Okay, this is how I started off dealing with stress. And when I got into my 30s, I started to get worn down. Before that, I was Superman, I finished dental school, went to medical school, did a six-year residency, life's great, I'm out in the community, I'm successful, I'm killing it. And then I started getting a little bit more out of shape, gaining a little bit of weight, and I'll never forget I was at, uh, it was, Easter, and I was with my uncle Bob, who's a, a triathlete, Ironman uh, competitor, and he's like, you look so good, what's going on? He's like, yeah, I'm stressed, I'm like, yeah, this is not working out, this and that, and he said, well, let's do a mountain climb. That one I started with, was to climb Mount Whitney. But what it did was, it got me to start exercising more regularly, and it gave me a little bit of a sense of purpose, and we'll talk about purpose and having a purpose and setting some goals for yourself. In this case, you're going to set a lofty goal. This is Gross Lochner in Austria. It's their highest mountain. And two years ago, I climbed this one. One of my techniques for combating my own personal burnout is I always put something out of books that I have to look forward to that's relaxing and gets me to the gym. So at this point in my life, I'm getting it to being in shape and being physically active and exercising is healthy. This sparked up a whole other thing that you can talk to. And this is Dr. Diva about, about buying gear and all that, which was not so. <laughs> complains about my mountain closet. But this is what we did just for your interest. That's the summit bridge on Gross Glockner. Really cool climb. People from all over the world are up there speak in all sorts of different languages. I climbed it with a professional Slovenian mountaineer. Um, and as you know, my wife is from Slovenia. We do a lot of climbing every year together. And it's got some really cool security that's built into the climb, so you can rope up climb that. And part of the reason that <clears throat> this worked for me is that what do you think you're worried about when you're right there? Are you worried about your prep rate? Are you worried about one foot in front of the other getting up the mountain? It's a very liberating feeling to be laser focused on what you're doing presently right here, right now. And I never understood why those mountains always called me, but that's going to get into something later when we talk about. Okay? So I'm enjoying myself here, not thinking about anything else. Present moment awareness. That's Marco there. He fell on that climb. That's why his chin's a little bit braided. But we made it to the top. Interestingly enough, there was a Catholic bishop that had made it to the top, I think, I want to say the 1700s, late 1700s maybe. And actually went up there with a bronze statue. I'm sure he did. He had a bunch of people bring a bronze statue up there, which they erected at the top of Gross Walker and then sitting at the top. So we got stress down. Everybody's got stress, everybody's got an allostatic load, that's going to be a moving target in your life. And now we're going to lead into burnout. Anybody know what burnout is? We're going to go through the definitions. Okay, emotional exhaustion, overextended and exhausted by work. Depersonalization, so you get a negative cynical attitude, you might treat your patients as objects more. Burnout. 
and sense of low personal accomplishment, feelings of incompetence, inefficiency, and inadequacy. These are the three realms that we study burnout in people, and we do that by giving them a burnout inventory that was popularized by Maslach. And this MBI is what we call it when we're doing work with psych folks or social workers. And they may give you one of these tests. I did that to D3 and 4 class two years ago as part of the normal scheme. And they scored exactly like medical students, pharmacy students, and everyone else. 30% of people meet criteria for burnout in one or two of these categories of the survey that you guys at any given time. That seems to be fairly consistent through all these health professional degrees. Okay, so students get burnout. Okay. Causes of burnout. Overwork, sleep deprivation, low control, and high responsibility. Inadequate support, lack of self-awareness, and imbalance between personal and professional life. And when we study people with burnout, one of the most important categories is this one the imbalance between personal and professional. Okay, consequences of it. For work, is you've got lower empathy. This has been studied. This is not me making this up. We get higher medical errors. We get people quitting practice, and they have poor personal relationships. All this stuff carries over at home. And you'll see increased rates of substance abuse. Auto, the auto accidents probably from distraction, stress-related health problems, which we talked about before, and marital and familial stress. So you need to figure out a way to combat burnout. Let's bring us to the next mountain. This is the big mountain. This is McKinley, now it's called Denali. In Alaska, this is over 20,000 feet. So this is, this is like midway into my mountaineering career. I decided I'm going to do this. My wife says, that dangerous? Ah, no, it's not. I'm going to go up to Alaska. It's going to be great. I'm going to climb this mountain. And I started looking into it. And it's going to take us about a month to complete expedition-style climbing. OK? Taking about 120 pounds a year pulling it behind you and carrying it on your back all the way up this, no Sherpa, or support or anything like that. And you're going to spend a lot of time in a tent. And if you know anything about mountaineering at all, it's the downtime that kills you. So I was, at this point, doing two, three, four, five-day expeditions, and I thought, man, I'm going to die in that tent at night potentially getting stuck somewhere in a snow torrent stone where I can't leave it. So I decided to do something about it. And what I did was take a mindfulness-based stress reduction course for the purposes of climbing this mountain. And it had some profound effects in my life that I didn't think it would translate into. So I enrolled in this class. And anybody have any? Familiarity with mindfulness at all? Raise your hands. Okay. We're going to do a little bit today, but I'm going to let this gentleman tell you about it and we'll watch a little video. This is John Kabat-Zinn. He works at the Mass General Hospital. He basically introduced this concept into Western medicine, and he has a chronic pain clinic there and has done some amazing research on mindfulness-based stress reduction, and he initiated that course which I've taken and taught him. So we'll see what he's got to say about mindfulness. Let's see if we can hear this. And we'll watch this about five minutes, okay? Mindfulness is actually a way of connecting with your life. Uh, and it's something that uh, doesn't involve a lot of energy. It involves a kind of a cultivating attention in a particular way. So what the way I define it is it's paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, 
And then I like to add sometimes, as if your life depended on it, because it does. Uh, attention is the faculty that allows us to navigate our lives in one way or another and to actually know what's happening or know that we don't know what's happening and find ways to um, be in uh, a wiser relationship to things that are going on in our lives than than being at the mercy, say, of our own emotional reactions and crazy thoughts and uh, fears and, and so forth. So uh, it's paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, uh, as if your life depended on it. So paying attention to what, you might ask? Well, it doesn't actually matter. It's, paying, it's the attending itself that's important, more important than what it is that you're paying attention to. But that said, um, if you start to pay attention to how much attention we pay to anything, you begin to notice that the mind is all over the place. It never sits still. It's got this idea and that opinion and this reaction, and we spend a huge amount of time um, planning and worrying about the future, and a huge amount of time reminiscing about the past and who did what to whom, or why it worked out this way, or why it didn't work out this way. And the present moment, which is the only time that we're ever alive in, the only time we could learn anything, express any kind of love or emotion, the only time we could be in our own body, the only time we can see or hear or smell or taste or touch or uh, communicate, is now. And yet the present moment gets completely squeezed out by all of our preoccupation with the future and the past. When we start to pay attention to our own mind and our own body, it's like reclaiming your life. Mindfulness is not a technique, uh, although there are many, many different ways to cultivate mindfulness. It's actually a way of being, being embodied, being in some sense in equilibrium with the comings and goings of the outer world, and even the comings and goings and the ups and downs of having a body, which of course has its wonders and is also at some time seriously problematic when we're dealing with health problems of one kind or another or uh, things that can happen to the body. And as long as we have this capacity for awareness, why not develop it? Much of the time, if you think about our educational system and how we grow up, we are trained more and more and more to get into thinking. And thinking is wonderful stuff, very powerful. Uh, some of the you know, greatest uh, achievements of humanity come out of thought uh, and out of imagination and out of creativity. But the other piece of it that's equally as powerful uh, as the capacity for thought is the capacity for awareness. But we get no training in awareness and attention, huge amount of training in thought. So a lot of the time when we get into bed at the end of a long day, we can't deal with our thoughts and we can't sleep. They just kind of perseverate over and over and over again. The same thoughts, we want to shut them out. The more you try to shut them out, the more they come in and pretty soon you don't get to sleep or you wind up with, a, a, you know, basically chronic anxiety or some kind of condition or other. Uh, depressive rumination can spiral you into uh, depression, uh, a little bit of sadness, and then that triggers this kind of perseverating constantly, what's wrong with me, why don't people like me, why didn't she look at me, whatever it is. These are all thoughts, I'm no good, I'm too old, I you know, my life is, it's all downhill from here. All of those things, they're only thoughts, but most of the time we think of them as the truth. So what mindfulness does in a way is it embraces the actuality of the mind, the heart, the body, and our relationality with the outer world, and gives us new degrees of freedom to navigate the ups and the downs and the ins and outs of our relationships with life, with other people, with uh, our own aspirations and our own fears, and also, and most fundamentally, with our own body. Now, most of us don't want to go anywhere near our own body except under very specialized circumstances at particular times. It seems like, wow, it's wonderful to have these bodily experiences. But a lot of the time, we're just pretty much up here. Thinking, 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 thinking. And really be believing so many of these thoughts as the truth that we wind up in a very narrow band of what's actually possible for us in terms of our human experience. So there's a lot of science on mindfulness. Uh, 
standard course that he teaches is eight sessions in duration. They take about two hours each. There is an entire center for mindfulness on the VCU campus, some very talented people doing some very interested, uh, interesting research, particularly in the area of functional MRIs, DNA repair, all sorts of stuff. So this is going to be the new frontier of exercise. It's going to be exercising our brains. <coughs> when I did the course originally, you know, you learn how to meditate. And a lot of it, it's a secular thing. It's a secular practice and you learn how to meditate. That's the formal practice of it. But there's there's other ways to do it too and they talk about a whole range of ways to cultivate mindfulness and cultivate awareness doing daily activities like even brushing your teeth. Focusing on what's happening at the present. And who wants to try it? I'm not going to call you in front of you can do it in front of everyone else. But we'll go ahead and we'll try it. We'll do like a little five minute exercise and, and we'll, see, uh, we'll see how it works. Um, everyone's going to need to put your food down. And, you know, what's, what, I, what I'm always interested in is, you know, what he says about having the moment that you're in right now is, it's true, right? Your past is gone. That's over. That doesn't exist anymore. In the future, is a concept that's may not even happen. So all you've really got is your moment right now, yet most of us aren't dropping into awareness of what's happening. All of you are going to drive somewhere today. You might arrive at your destination without even realizing how you got there. You're going to eat an ice cream cone and swallow the last bit and never really thought about how that tasted, what the sensation was on your mouth. So most of you are living your lives on automatic pilot which is okay because I do that most of the time. Also, I just don't sit around meditating. I've got this <laughs> but if we want to bring awareness of this present moment right now to us, just kind of sit up straight and get yourself in what we call the dignified position. You should feel like you're being held up on your own net. Okay? And what you'll notice right away is there's a bunch of stuff going on. Your eyes are open, so you've got your vision. Ears are open, you can hear things. You got a sense of smell, which is the dental school, you can smell all sorts of stuff, particularly in the wood building, right? And then you've got this proprioception, you can tune into what your rear end feels like in the chair. Your feet are on the ground, okay? And we're going to close your eyes and we're just going to try to focus on your breath. And this isn't an exercise in shutting out everything else, focus on your breathing. Okay, I want you to breathe in through your nostrils. Hold that there for a second. And then breathe out through your nose. And the purpose of this today is to just try to focus on our breath and bring our breath to the forefront. Breathe in through your nose. Pause for a second. Breathe out through your nose. And you can focus on little parts you're breathing through your nose. So you may notice that your nostrils flare and you breathe in through your nose. And breathe out. Maybe the air quality when you breathe in is a little bit cooler than that breath when you breathe out. Let's just keep on breathing in and out, trying to bring our breath to the forefront. Should be natural. Your body knows how to do it. You've got to breathe. Be a big problem. Now, no matter if you've been meditating for 50 years or if this is your first time, you'll notice that the mind may wander when you're trying this breathing. The mind also makes commentary when you're trying 
trying to do this. Some of you may be thinking, how can I get out of this room? All everyone's eyes are closed. Because I've got a million other things to do, right? And that's okay. When that happens, just focus back on your breath. surfing your breath. You don't have to inhale in a special way or exhale in a special way. And you don't have to achieve anything. You're not going to get enlightenment and you're not going to solve all your dental school problems during this session. Just bring awareness to your breath. And whenever your mind starts to walk, You might get tired and you don't want to have that happen. The purpose is not to fall asleep, the purpose is to be aware. And everyone's got their eyes open. So that's your first, for some of you, experience with mindfulness based meditation. So that's a formal practice for mindfulness based stress reduction. And when you're at home, you can Google and YouTube and there's a bunch of science about that. But doing it for eight sessions will shrink your amygdala, which is a very small area in your brain that deals with stress. And they've done that on functional MRIs. That's real science. A lot of new research going on on DNA, DNA repair with mindfulness, all sorts of stuff. So there's all sorts of health implications for that. And we'll take a look at what Anderson Cooper experienced when he did it. Some of you may have seen this on So he just did the exercise you did, and we're going to take a look at the neurophysiology behind it. And whenever you're, look, no one was a bigger skeptic of this than me. I went to my first meditation class, I can't even tell you this. It's, it's a workout and it takes some work. So it's like going to the gym. It doesn't happen in one sitting. But we'll take a look at, uh, at this video here. This is just the next generation of exercise. We've got the physical you know, exercise components uh, down. And now it's about working out how can we actually train our minds. Dr. Brewer is trying to understand how mindfulness can alter the functioning of the brain. He uses a cap lined with 128 electrodes. We're going to start filling each of these 128 wells with conduction gel. The electrodes are able to pick up signals from the posterior cingulate, part of a brain network linked to memory and emotion. This is all just picking up electrical signal from the top of your head. Since attending the mindfulness retreat, I'd been meditating daily and was curious to see if it had an impact on my brain. We're going to have you start with thinking of something that was very anxiety provoking for you. Okay. When I thought about something stressful, the cells in my brain's posterior cingulate immediately started firing, shown by the red lines that went off the chart on the computer screen. Just drop into meditation. Okay. When I let go of those stressful thoughts and refocused on my breath, within seconds the brain cells that had been firing quieted down, 
shown by the blue lines on the computer. That's really fascinating to see like that. Dr. Brewer believes everyone can train their brains to reach that blue mindfulness zone. But he says all the technology we're surrounded by makes it difficult. So we've got a couple slides here on mindfulness. We can give this lecture to Alina. Um, be fully aware of the present moment, not judgmentally. So the opposite of multitasking or autopilot. And allows us to be aware of actions, emotions. And it's associated with decreased stress, improved mental and physical health. No doubt about it. So we ran a mindfulness course at the school here, one of the IPEC courses here, professional education courses, and we try to introduce people into many facets of doing it. I don't sit around meditating all day. Um, I get up in the morning every day at 4.45, do some stretching, do some deep breathing, and I do aerobic exercise for some weight. That's my time for me. I get that all done before my kids wake up and my wife wakes up because then it's just chaos. So that's my approach to keeping myself resilient, keeping myself in the sweet spot in my career. You all are going to you know, have to find out what works for you, and that's going to change. It doesn't need to be straight up formal meditation, sports, arts, crafts, music, and education travel, that sort of stuff. So a lot of different things that you can do to promote well-being. If you want to know about Denali, this is this is above 17,500 feet here, coming down here. And when you're doing this, this is laser focus mindfulness. Definitely walking meditation. And whenever you're doing these big mountain climbs, it really is like your life condensed into one short thing. So you're going to have periods of elation, and you're going to follow that up by periods of abject fear, wondering if you're going to get to the top, ruminations like Dr. Zinn talked about, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not going to make it, and uh, that sort of stuff. Particularly when, when we were up there, there were about, I think there were five, six fatalities during the time I was there. So very, very serious stuff. We made it successfully. That's uh, one of the high camps up there. And you can understand why I was worried about being in this room with the guy that I don't know telling me his life story for five days, which is exactly what happened. That's a whole, that's a whole other lecture. But uh, we did get stuck at 17,500 feet for five days, and what I found out with the mindfulness was that aside from being physically ready for the climb and being in phenomenal shape, the best thing I did was the mindfulness based stress reduction. And when I got home, I couldn't help but carry over some of the stuff into my daily practice, which is oral surgery is exceedingly stressful. So if you can time yourself out, even between surgeries, and take a few deep breaths, that gives you some sort of resilience and gets you back to your base and lets you go on. Your patients pick up on your stress and your burnout, so it's good for you, it's good for them. Um, this is Charles, who was my tent mate, who came back from the summit and asked me if that was a problem, <laughs> to which I replied, yes, that's a big problem. I didn't let him know that he was going to use this little finger amputee, but that's what frostbite looks like. So he's got no circulation there. We're up at the top, but now I'm really starting to deep breathe because I'm thinking, okay, we're going to get Charles down from here with one lane. Um, so Charles is a driver for FedEx. I'll show you his bionic finger. Um, he did make it down, obviously. This one play. We don't get to see Charles. Let's do that. Anyway, he got a little cart and figure. Uh, he was a hazardous driver for Federal Express, so he used his hands a lot. So I came into the mindfulness by a strange route. I did up climbing mountains and ended up going to the top of Denali before I figured it out. This is an article that we published 
done on professional students from school of nursing. There were some dental students in those pharmacy students. And we went through and gave them an eight-week course. I checked 525. We may run it again this year. And we had them fill out some measure pre and post study and found out that the training is feasible, A, we had that before. And stress, anxiety, burnout are significantly reduced after mindfulness training. <coughs> and we had to do some further research. Skeptics on it say, oh, but the benefits only last as long as the practice. So what? That's the same thing with going to the gym, the benefits only going to last as long as you keep up with your exercise program. If you're on a diet, it's only going to last as long as you're on your diet. So it's something that you're going to work, keep working at. And uh, if you guys are interested in it, maybe we'll run that course again. And that's all I got. We're supposed to be done at 12.45. We've got time for some questions. <clears throat> yes? You can get it. Cody has a site um, at the main school, and there's some mindfulness stuff. So if you use uh, Google, DCU, Mindfulness, there's a center for contemplative thought, and they've got mindfulness-based stress reduction courses going on. We may run this course in the spring. That's when we've done it before. If we do, someone will put it on the uh, School of Dentistry website. Unfortunately, a lot of the interprofessional education courses, there's not dedicated time for you to get to them, so you kind of have to juggle your, your schedule. So this study we did meditation, and then we had a whole host of other things we were having people do. There was a homework assignment, mindful driving, there was some mindful eating, mindful uh, color walks, meditative walking, all sorts of stuff. So during the class we focused on it mostly being a yoga mindfulness intervention with some also uh, straight up meditation. A lot of the yoga based because Patricia comes over at the schoolers and does a lot of research in yoga. Yoga is a great way to get into this. That's essentially very simple. Second question. I go to bed at night. I go to bed at uh, <laughs> in bed at nine, probably sleep at ten. And I'm up. I'm up at four forty five drinking coffee. My wife is up I'm I'm out at ten. But that's that's just what works for me.